Volume two, part two, chapter forty four of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter forty four. How Sancho Panza was conducted to his government and of the strange adventure that befell don quixote in the castle it is stated they say in the true original of this history that when cide hamet came to write this chapter his interpreter did not translate it as he wrote it that is as a kind of complaint the more made against himself for having taken in hand a story so dry and of so little variety as this of don quixote for he found himself forced to speak perpetually of him and sancho without venturing to indulge in digressions and episodes more serious and more interesting he said too that to go on mind hand pen always restricted to writing upon one single subject and speaking through the mouths of the few characters was intolerable drudgery the result of which was never equal to the author's labour and that to avoid this he had in the first part availed himself of the device of novels like the ill-advised curiosity and the captive captain which stand as it were apart from the story the others are given there being incidents which occurred to don quixote himself and could not be omitted he also thought he says that many engrossed by the interest attaching to the exploits of don quixote would take none in the novels and pass them over hastily or impatiently without noticing the elegance and art of their composition which would be very manifest were they published by themselves and not as mere adjuncts to the crazes of don quixote or the simplicities of sancho therefore in this second part he thought it best not to insert novels either separate or interwoven but only episodes something like them arising out of the circumstances the facts present and even these sparingly and with no more words than suffice to make them plain and as he confines and restricts himself to the narrow limits of the narrative though he has ability capacity and brains enough to deal with the whole universe he requests that his labours may not be despised and that credit be given him not alone for what he writes but for what he has refrained from writing and so he goes on with his story saying that the day don quixote gave the counsels to sancho the same afternoon after dinner he handed them to him in writing so that he might get someone to read them to him they had scarcely however been given to him when he let them drop and they fell into the hands of the duke who showed them to the duchess and they were both amazed afresh at the madness and wit of don quixote to carry on the joke then the same evening they dispatched sancho with a large following to the village that was to serve him for an island it happened that the person who had him in charge was a majordomo of the duke's a man of great discretion and humour and there can be no humour without discretion and the same who played the part of the countess trifaldi in the comical way that has been already described and thus qualified and instructed by his master and mistress as to how to deal with sancho he carried out their scheme admirably now it came to pass that as soon as sancho saw this majordomo he seemed in his features to recognize those of the trifaldi and turning to his master he said to him senor either the devil will carry me off here on this spot righteous and believing or your worship will own to me that the face of this majordomo of the duke's here is the very face of the distressed one don quixote regarded the majordomo attentively and having done so said to sancho there is no reason why the devil should carry thee off sancho either righteous or believing and what thou meanest by that i know not the face of the distressed one is that of the majordomo but for all that the majordomo is not the distressed one for his being so would involve a mighty contradiction but this is not the time for going into questions of the sort which would be involving ourselves in an inextricable labyrinth believe me my friend we must pray earnestly to our lord that he deliver us both from wicked wizards and enchanters it is no joke senor said sancho for before this i heard him speak and it seemed exactly as if the voice of the trifaldi was sounding in my ears well i'll hold my peace but i'll take care to be on the lookout henceforth for any sign that may be seen to confirm or do away with this suspicion thou wilt do well sancho said don quixote and thou wilt let me know all thou discoverest and all that befalls thee in thy government 
Sancho at last set out, attended by a great number of people. He was dressed in the garb of a lawyer, with a gabon of tawny watered camlet over all, and a montera cap of the same material, and mounted a la jineta upon a mule. Behind him, in accordance with the duke's orders, followed Dapple, with brand-new ass trappings and ornaments of silk, and from time to time Sancho turned round to look at his ass, so well pleased to have him with him that he would not have changed places with the Emperor of Germany. On taking leave he kissed the hands of the duke and duchess, and got his master's blessing, which Don Quixote gave him with tears, and he received blubbering. Let worthy Sancho go in peace, and good luck to him, gentle reader, and look out for two bushels of laughter, which the account of how he behaved himself in office will give thee. In the meantime, turn thy attention to what happened his master the same night, and if thou dost not laugh thereat, at any rate thou wilt stretch thy mouth with a grin, for Don Quixote's adventures must be honoured either with wonder or with laughter. It is recorded, then, that as soon as Sancho had gone, Don Quixote felt his loneliness, and had it been possible for him to revoke the mandate and take away the government from him, he would have done so. The Duchess observed his dejection, and asked him why he was melancholy, because, she said, if it was for the loss of Sancho, there were squires, duennas, and damsels in her house who would wait upon him to his full satisfaction. The truth is, senora, replied Don Quixote, that I do feel the loss of Sancho, but that is not the main cause of my looking sad, and of all the offers your excellence makes me, I accept only the good will with which they are made and as to the remainder i entreat of your excellence to permit and allow me alone to wait upon myself in my chamber indeed senor don quixote said the duchess that must not be four of my damsels as beautiful as flowers shall wait upon you to me said don quixote they will not be flowers but thorns to pierce my heart they or anything like them shall as soon enter my chamber as fly if your highness wishes to gratify me still further though i deserve it not permit me to please myself and wait upon myself in my own room for i place a barrier between my inclinations and my virtue and i do not wish to break this rule through the generosity your highness is disposed to display towards me and in short i will sleep in my clothes sooner than allow any one to undress me say no more senor don quixote say no more said the duchess i assure you i will give orders that not even a fly not to say a damsel shall enter your room i am not the one to undermine the propriety of senor don quixote for it strikes me that among his many virtues the one that is pre-eminent is that of modesty your worship may undress and dress in private and in your own way as you please and when you please for there will be no one to hinder you and in your chamber you will find all the utensils requisite to supply the wants of one who sleeps with his door locked to the end that no natural needs compel you to open it may the great dulcinea del toboso live a thousand years and may her fame extend all over the surface of the globe for she deserves to be loved by a knight so valiant and so virtuous and may kind heaven infuse zeal into the heart of our governor sancho panza to finish off his discipline speedily so that the world may once more enjoy the beauty of so grand a lady to which don quixote replied your highness has spoken like what you are from the mouth of a noble lady nothing bad can come and dulcinea will be more fortunate and better known to the world by the praise of your highness than by all the eulogies the greatest orators on earth could bestow upon her well well senor don quixote said the duchess it is nearly supper-time and the duke is probably waiting come let us go to supper and retire to rest early for the journey you made yesterday from Kandy was not such a short one but that it must have caused you some fatigue i feel none senora said don quixote for i would go so far as to swear to your excellence that in all my life i never mounted a quieter beast or a pleasanter paced one than clavileno and i don't know what could have induced malambruno to discard a steed so swift and so gentle and burn it so recklessly as he did probably said the duchess repenting of the evil he had done to the trifaldi and company and others and the crimes he must have committed as a wizard and enchanter he resolved to make away with all the instruments of his craft and so burn clavileno as the chief one and that which mainly kept him restless wandering from land to land and by its ashes and the trophy of the placard 
the valour of the great don quixote of la mancha is established for ever don quixote renewed his thanks to the duchess and having supped retired to his chamber alone refusing to allow any one to enter with him to wait on him such was his fear of encountering temptations that might lead or drive him to forget his chaste fidelity to his lady dulcinea for he had always present to his mind the virtue of amadis that flower and mirror of knights-errant he locked the door behind him and by the light of two wax candles undressed himself but as he was taking off his stockings oh disaster unworthy of such a personage there came a burst not of sighs or anything belying his delicacy or good breeding but of some two dozen stitches in one of his stockings that made it look like a window lattice the worthy gentleman was beyond measure distressed and at that moment he would have given an ounce of silver to have had half a drachm of green silk there i say green silk because the stockings were green here cid hamet exclaimed as he was writing oh poverty poverty i know not what could have possessed the great cordovan poet to call the holy gift ungratefully received although a moor i know well enough from the intercourse i have had with christians that holiness consists in charity humility faith obedience and poverty but for all that i say he must have a great deal of godliness who can find any satisfaction in being poor unless indeed it be the kind of poverty one of their greatest saints refers to saying possess all things as though ye possess them not which is what they call poverty in spirit but thou that other poverty for it is of thee i am speaking now why dost thou love to fall out with gentlemen and men of good birth more than with other people why dost thou compel them to smear the cracks in their shoes and to have the buttons of their coats one silk another hair and another glass why must their ruffs be always crinkled like endive leaves and not crimped with a crimping iron from this we may perceive the iniquity of starch and crimped ruffs then he goes on poor gentleman of good family always cockering up his honour dining miserably and in secret and making a hypocrite of the toothpick with which he sallies out into the street after eating nothing to oblige him to use it poor fellow i say with his nervous honour fancying they perceive a league off the patch on his shoe the sweat stains on his hat the shabbiness of his cloak fancying they perceive a league off the patch on his shoe the sweat stains on his hat the shabbiness of his cloak and the hunger of his stomach all this was brought home to don quixote by the bursting of his stitches however he comforted himself on perceiving that sancho had left behind a pair of travelling boots which he resolved to wear the next day at last he went to bed out of spirits and heavy at heart as much because he missed sancho as because of the irreparable disaster to his stockings the stitches of which he would have even taken up with silk of another colour which is one of the greatest signs of poverty a gentleman can show in the course of his never-failing embarrassments he put out the candles but the night was warm and he could not sleep he rose from his bed and opened slightly a grated window that looked out on a beautiful garden and as he did so he perceived and heard people walking and talking in the garden he set himself to listen attentively and those below raised their voices so that he could hear these words urge me not to sing aramencia for thou knowest that ever since the stranger entered the castle and my eyes beheld him i cannot sing but only weep besides my lady is a light rather than a heavy sleeper and i would not for all the wealth of the world that she found us here and even if she were asleep and did not waken my singing would be in vain if this strange aeneas who has come into my neighbourhood to flout me sleeps on and wakens not to hear it heed not that dear altisidora replied a voice the duchess is no doubt asleep and everybody in the house save the lord of thy heart and disturber of thy soul for just now i perceived him open the grated window of his chamber so he must be awake sing my poor sufferer in a low sweet tone to the accompaniment of thy harp and even if the duchess hears us we can lay the blame on the heat of the night that is not the point emerencia replied altisidora it is that i would not that my singing should lay bare my heart and that i should be thought a light and wanton maiden by those who know not the mighty power of love but come what may better a blush on the cheeks than a sore in the heart and here a harp softly touched made itself heard as he listened to all this don quixote was in a state of breathless amazement 
for immediately the countless adventures like this with windows gratings gardens serenades love-makings and languishings that he had read of in his trashy books of chivalry came to his mind he at once concluded that some damsel of the duchess's was in love with him and that her modesty forced her to keep her passion secret he trembled lest he should fall and made an inward resolution not to yield and commending himself with all his might and soul to his lady dulcinea he made up his mind to listen to the music and to let them know he was there he gave a pretended sneeze at which the damsels were not a little delighted for all they wanted was that don quixote should hear them so having tuned the harp altisidora running her hand across the strings began this ballad o thou that art above in bed between the holland sheets a lying there from night till morn with outstretched legs asleep o thou most valiant knight of all the famed manchegan breed of purity and virtue more than gold of araby give ear unto a suffering maid well grown but evil starred for those two sons of thine have lit a fire within her heart adventures seeking thou dost rove to others bringing woe thou scatterest wounds but ah the balm to heal them dost withhold say valiant youth and so may god thy enterprises speed didst thou the light mid libya's sands or jaca's rocks first see did scaly serpents give thee suck who nursed thee when a babe wert cradled in the forest rude or gloomy mountain cave old dulcinea may be proud that plump and lusty maid for she alone hath had the power a tiger fierce to tame and she for this shall famous be from tagus to harama from manzanares to henil from duero to arlanza fain would i change with her and give a petticoat to boot the best and bravest that i have all trimmed with gold galoon oh for to be the happy fair thy mighty arms enfold or even sit beside thy bed and scratch thy dusty pole i rave to favours such as these unworthy to aspire thy feet to tickle were enough for one so mean as i what caps what slippers silver laced would i on thee bestow what damask breeches make for thee what fine long holland cloaks and i would give thee pearls that should as big as oak galls show so matchless big that each might well be called the great alone manchegan nero look not down from thy tarpeian rock upon this burning heart nor add the fuel of thy wrath a virgin soft and young am i not yet fifteen years old i'm only three months past fourteen i swear upon my soul i hobble not nor do i limp all blemish i'm without and as i walk my lily locks are trailing on the ground and though my nose be rather flat and though my mouth be wide my teeth like topazes exalt my beauty to the sky thou knowest that my voice is sweet that is if thou dost hear and i am moulded in a form somewhat below the mean these charms and many more are thine spoils to thy spear and bow all a damsel of this house am i by name altisidora here the lay of the heart-stricken altisidora came to an end while the warmly wooed don quixote began to feel alarm and with a deep sigh he said to himself oh that i should be such an unlucky knight that no damsel can set eyes on me but falls in love with me oh that the peerless dulcinea should be so unfortunate that they cannot let her enjoy my incomparable constancy in peace what would ye with her ye queens why do you persecute her ye empresses why ye pursue her ye virgins of from fourteen to fifteen leave the unhappy being to triumph rejoice and glory in the lot love has been pleased to bestow upon her in surrendering my heart and yielding up my soul to her ye love smitten host know that to dulcinea only i am dough and sugar paste flint to all others for her i am honey for you aloes for me dulcinea alone is beautiful wise virtuous graceful and high-bred and all others are ill-favoured foolish light and low-born nature sent me into the world to be hers and no others altisidora may weep or sing the lady for whose sake they belaboured me in the castle of the enchanted moor may give way to despair but i must be dulcinea's boiled or roast pure courteous and chaste in spite of all the magic working powers on earth and with that he shut the window with a bang and as much out of temper and out of sorts 
as if some great misfortune had befallen him, stretched himself on his bed, where we will leave him for the present, as the great Sancho Panza, who is about to set up his famous government, now demands our attention. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 44 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 45 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 45 Of how the great Sancho Panza took possession of his island, and of how he made a beginning in governing. O oh, perpetual discoverer of the antipodes, torch of the world, eye of heaven, sweet stimulator of the water-coolers, Thimbraeus here, Phoebus there, now archer, now physician, father of poetry, inventor of music, thou that always risest, and, notwithstanding appearances, never settest, to thee, O son, by whose aid man begetteth man, to thee I appeal to help me, and lighten the darkness of my wit, that I may be able to proceed with scrupulous exactitude in giving an account of the great Sancho Panza's government, for without thee I feel myself weak, feeble, and uncertain to come to the point then sancho with all his attendants arrived at a village of some thousand inhabitants and one of the largest the duke possessed they informed him that it was called the island of barataria either because the name of the village was baratario or because of the joke by way of which the government had been conferred upon him on reaching the gates of the town which was a walled one the municipality came forth to meet him the bells rang out a peal and the inhabitants showed every sign of general satisfaction and with great pomp they conducted him to the principal church to give thanks to god and then with burlesque ceremonies they presented him with the keys of the town and acknowledged him as perpetual governor of the island of barataria the costume the beard and the fat squat figure of the new governor astonished all those who were not in on the secret and even all who were and they were not a few finally leading him out of the church they carried him to the judgment seat and seated him on it and the duke's majordomo said to him it is an ancient custom in this island senor governor that he who comes to take possession of this famous island is bound to answer a question which shall be put to him and which must be a somewhat naughty and difficult one and by his answer the people take the measure of their new governor's wit and hail with joy or deplore his arrival accordingly while the majordomo was making this speech sancho was gazing at several large letters inscribed on the wall opposite his seat and as he could not read he asked what that was that was painted on the wall the answer was senor there is written and recorded the day on which your lordship took possession of this island and the inscription says this day the so-and-so of such and such a month and year senor don sancho panza took possession of this island many years may he enjoy it and whom do they call don sancho panza asked sancho your lordship replied the majordomo for no other panza but the one who is now seated in that chair has ever entered this island well then let me tell you brother said sancho i haven't got the don nor has any one of my family ever had it my name is plain sancho panza and sancho was my father's name and sancho was my grandfather's and they were all panzas without any dons or donas tacked on i suspect that in this island there are more dons than stones but never mind god knows what i mean and maybe if my government lasts four days i'll weed out these dons that no doubt are as great a nuisance as the midges they're so plenty let the majordomo go on with his question and i'll give the best answer i can whether the people deplore or not at this instant there came into court two old men one carrying a cane by way of a walking-stick and the one who had no stick said senor some time ago i lent this good man ten gold crowns in gold to gratify him and do him a service on the condition that he was to return them to me whenever i should ask for them a long time passed before i asked for them for i would not put him to any greater straits to return them than he was in when i lent them to him but thinking he was growing careless about payment i asked for them once and several times 
and not only will he not give them back, but he denies that he owes them, and says I never lent him any such crowns, or if I did, that he repaid them, and I have no witnesses either of the loan or the payment, for he never paid me. I want your worship to put him to his oath, and if he swears he returned them to me, I forgive him the debt here and before God. What say you to this, good old man, you with a stick, said Sancho? To which the old man replied, I admit, senor, that he lent them to me. But let your worship lower your staff, and as he leaves it to my oath, I'll swear that I gave them back and paid him really and truly. The governor lowered the staff, and as he did so, the old man who had the stick handed it to the other old man to hold for him while he swore as if he found it in his way, and then laid his hand on the cross of the staff, saying that it was true the ten crowns that were demanded of him had been lent him, but that he had with his own hand given them back into the hand of the other, and that he, not recollecting it, was always asking for them. Seeing this, the great governor asked the creditor what answer he had to make to what his opponent said. He said that no doubt his debtor had told the truth, for he believed him to be an honest man and a good Christian, and he himself must have forgotten when and how he had given back the crowns and from that time forth he would make no further demand upon him. The debtor took his stick again, and bowing his head, left the court. Observing this, and how without another word he made off, and observing too the resignation of the plaintiff, Sancho buried his head in his bosom, and remained for a short space in deep thought, with the forefinger of his right hand on his brow and nose. Then he raised his head and bade them call back the old man with the stick, for he had already taken his departure. They brought him back, and as soon as Sancho saw him, he said, Honest man, give me that stick, for I want it. Willingly, said the old man, here it is, senor, and he put it into his hand. Sancho took it, and, handing it to the other old man, said to him, Go, and God be with you, for now you are paid. I, senor, returned the old man, why, is this cane worth ten gold crowns? Yes, said the governor, or if not, I am the greatest dolt in the world. Now you will see whether I have got the headpiece to govern a whole kingdom. And he ordered the cane to be broken in two, there in the presence of all. It was done, and in the middle of it they found ten gold crowns. All were filled with amazement and looked upon their governor as another Solomon. They asked him how he had come to the conclusion that the ten crowns were in the cane. He replied that observing how the old man who swore gave the stick to his opponent while he was taking the oath, and swore that he had really and truly given him the crowns, and how as soon as he had done swearing he asked for the stick again, it came into his head that the sum demanded must be inside it. And from this he said it might be seen that God sometimes guides those who govern in their judgments, even though they may be fools. Besides, he had himself heard the curate of his village mention just such another case, and he had so good a memory that if it was not that he forgot everything he wished to remember, there would not be such a memory in all the island. To conclude, the old men went off, one crestfallen, and the other in high contentment. All who were present were astonished, and he who was recording the words, deeds, and movements of Sancho could not make up his mind whether he was to look upon him and set him down as a fool or as a man of sense. As soon as this case was disposed of, there came into court a woman, holding on with a tight grip to a man dressed like a well-to-do cattle dealer, and she came forward making a great outcry and exclaiming, justice senor governor justice and if i don't get it on earth i'll go look for it in heaven senor governor of my soul this wicked man caught me in the middle of the fields here and used my body as if it was an ill-washed rag and woe is me got from me what i had kept these three and twenty years and more defending it against moors and christians natives and strangers and i always as hard as an oak and keeping myself as pure as a salamander in the fire or wool among the brambles for this good fellow to come now with clean hands to handle me. It remains to be proved whether this gallant has clean hands or not, said Sancho, and turning to the man he asked him what he had to say in answer to the woman's charge. He, all in confusion, made answer, Sirs, I am a poor pig dealer, and this morning I left the village to sell, saving your presence, four pigs, and between dews and cribbings they got out of me little less than the worth of them. As I was returning to my village, I fell in on the road with this good dame, and the devil who makes a coil and a mess out of everything yoked us together. I paid her fairly, but she not contented laid hold of me and never let go until she brought me here. She says I forced her, 
but she lies by the oath i swear or am ready to swear and this is the whole truth and every particle of it the governor on this asked him if he had any money in silver about him he said he had about twenty ducats and a leather purse in his bosom the governor bade him take it out and hand it to the complainant he obeyed trembling the woman took it and making a thousand salaams to all and praying to god for the long life and health of the senor governor who had such regard for distressed orphans and virgins she hurried out of court with the purse grasped in both her hands first looking however to see if the money it contained was silver as soon as she was gone sancho said to the cattle dealer whose tears were already starting and whose eyes and heart were following his purse good fellow go after that woman and take the purse from her by force even and come back with it here and he did not say it to one who was a fool or deaf for the man was off like a flash of lightning and ran to do as he was bid all the bystanders waited anxiously to see the end of the case and presently both men and woman came back at even closer grips than before she with her petticoat up and the purse in the lap of it and he struggling hard to take it from her but all to no purpose so stout was the woman's defence she all the while crying out justice from god in the world see here senor governor the shamelessness and boldness of this villain who in the middle of the town in the middle of the street wanted to take from me the purse your worship bade him give me and did he take it asked the governor take it said the woman i'd let my life be taken from me sooner than the purse a pretty child i'd be it's another sort of cat they must throw in my face and not that poor scurvy knave pinchers and hammers mallets and chisels would not get it out of my grip no nor lion's claws the soul from out of my body first she is right said the man i own myself beaten and powerless i confess i haven't the strength to take it from her and he let go his hold of her upon this the governor said to the woman let me see that purse my worthy and sturdy friend she handed it to him at once and the governor returned it to the man and said to the unforced mistress of force sister if you had shown as much or only half as much spirit and vigour in defending your body as you have shown in defending that purse the strength of hercules could not have forced you be off and god speed you and bad luck to you and don't show your face in all this island or within six leagues of it on any side under pain of two hundred lashes be off at once i say you shameless cheating shrew the woman was cowed and went off disconsolately hanging her head and the governor said to the man honest man go home with your money and god speed you and for the future if you don't want to lose it see that you don't take it into your head to yoke with anybody the man thanked him as clumsily as he could and went his way and the bystanders were again filled with admiration at their new governor's judgments and sentences next two men one apparently a farm labourer and the other a tailor for he had a pair of shears in his hand presented themselves before him and the tailor said senor governor this labourer and i come before your worship by reason of this honest man coming to my shop yesterday for saving everybody's presence i'm a past tailor god be thanked and putting a piece of cloth into my hands and asking me senor will there be enough in this cloth to make me a cap measuring the cloth i said there would he probably suspected as i supposed and i supposed right that i wanted to steal some of the cloth led to think so by his own roguery and the bad opinion people have of tailors and he told me to see if there would be enough for two i guessed what he would be at and i said yes he still following up his original unworthy notion went on adding cap after cap and i yes after yes until we got as far as five he has just this moment come for them i gave them to him but he won't pay me for the making on the contrary he calls upon me to pay him or else return his cloth is all this true brother said sancho yes replied the man but will your worship make him show the five caps he has made me with all my heart said the tailor and drawing his hand from under his cloak he showed five caps stuck upon the five fingers of it and said there are the caps this good man asked for and by god and upon my conscience i haven't a scrap of cloth left and i'll let the work be examined by the inspectors of the trade all present laughed at the number of caps and the novelty of the suit sancho set himself to think for a moment and then said it seems to me that in this case it is not necessary to deliver long-winded arguments but only to give off-hand the judgment of an honest man and so my decision is that the tailor lose the making and the labourer the cloth and that the caps go to the prisoners in the jail and let there be no more about it if the previous decision about the cattle dealer's purse excited the admiration of the bystanders this provoked their laughter 
However, the governor's orders were after all executed. All this, having been taken down by his chronicler, was at once dispatched to the duke, who was looking out for it with great eagerness. And here let us leave the good Sancho, for his master, sorely troubled in mind by Altisidora's music, has pressing claims upon us now. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 45 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 46 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter forty six of the terrible bell and cat fright that don quixote got in the course of the enamoured altisidora's wooing we left don quixote wrapped up in the reflections which the music of the enamoured maid altisidora had given rise to he went to bed with them and just like fleas they would not let him sleep or get a moment's rest and the broken stitches of his stockings helped them but as time is fleet and no obstacle can stay his course he came riding on the hours and morning very soon arrived seeing which don quixote quitted the soft down and no wise slothful dressed himself in his chamois suit and put on his travelling boots to hide the disaster to his stockings he threw over him his scarlet mantle put on his head a montera of green velvet trimmed with silver edging flung across his shoulder the baldric with his good trenchant sword, took up a large rosary that he always carried with him, and with great solemnity and precision of gait proceeded to the antechamber, where the duke and duchess were already dressed and waiting for him. But as he passed through a gallery, Altisidora and the other damsel, her friend, were lying in wait for him, and the instant Altisidora saw him she pretended to faint, while her friend caught her in her lap, and began hastily unlacing the bosom of her dress don quixote observed it and approaching them said i know very well what this seizure arises from i know not from what replied the friend for altisidora is the healthiest damsel in all this house and i have never heard her complain all the time i have known her a plague on all the knights errant in the world if they be all ungrateful go away senor don quixote for this poor child will not come to herself again so long as you are here. To which Don Quixote returned, Do me the favour, senora, to let a lute be placed in my chamber to-night, and I will comfort this poor maiden to the best of my power, for in the early stages of love a prompt disillusion is an approved remedy, and with this he retired so as not to be remarked by any who might see him there. He had scarcely withdrawn when Altisidora, recovering from her swoon said to her companion the lute must be left for no doubt don quixote intends to give us some music and being his it will not be bad they went at once to inform the duchess of what was going on and of the lute don quixote asked for and she delighted beyond measure plotted with the duke and her two damsels to play him a trick that should be amusing but harmless and in high glee they waited for night which came quickly as the day had come and as for the day the duke and duchess spent it in charming conversation with don quixote when eleven o'clock came don quixote found a guitar in his chamber he tried it opened the window and perceived that some persons were walking in the garden and having passed his fingers over the frets of the guitar and tuned it as well as he could he spat and cleared his chest and then with a voice a little hoarse but full-toned he sang the following ballad which he had himself that day composed mighty love the hearts of maidens doth unsettle and perplex and the instrument he uses most of all is idleness sewing stitching any labour having always work to do to the poison love instilleth is the antidote most sure and to proper-minded maidens who desire the matron's name modesty's a marriage portion modesty their highest praise men of prudence and discretion courtiers gay and gallant knights with the wanton damsels dally but the modest take to wife there are passions transient fleeting loves and hostelries declared sunrise loves with sunset ended when the guest hath gone his way 
love that springs up swift and sudden here to-day to-morrow flown passes leaves no trace behind it leaves no image on the soul painting that is laid on painting maketh no display or show where one's beauty's in possession there no other can take hold dulcinea del toboso painted on my heart i wear never from its tablets never can her image be erased the quality of all in lovers most esteemed is constancy tis by this that love works wonders this exalts them to the skies don quixote had got so far with his song to which the duke the duchess altisidora and nearly the whole household of the castle were listening when all of a sudden from a gallery above that was exactly over his window they let down a cord with more than a hundred bells attached to it and immediately after that discharged a great sack full of cats which also had bells of smaller size tied to their tails such was the din of the bells and the squalling of the cats that though the duke and duchess were the contrivers of the joke they were startled by it while don quixote stood paralyzed with fear and as luck would have it two or three of the cats made their way in through the grating of his chamber and flying from one side to the other made it seem as if there was a legion of devils at large in it they extinguished the candles that were burning in the room and rushed about seeking some way of escape the cord with the large bells never ceased rising and falling and most of the people of the castle not knowing what was really the matter were at their wits end with astonishment don quixote sprang to his feet and drawing his sword began making passes at the grating shouting out avant malignant enchanters avant ye witchcraft working rabble i am don quixote of la mancha against whom your evil machinations avail not nor have any power and turning upon the cats that were running about the room he made several cuts at them they dashed at the grating and escaped by it save one that finding itself hard pressed by the slashes of don quixote's sword flew at his face and held on to his nose tooth and nail with the pain of which he began to shout his loudest the duke and duchess hearing this and guessing what it was ran with all haste to his room and as the poor gentleman was contriving with all his might to detach the cat from his face they opened the door with a master key and went in with lights and witnessed the unequal combat the duke ran forward to part the combatants but don quixote cried out aloud let no one take him from me leave me hand to hand with this demon this wizard this enchanter i will teach him i myself who don quixote of la mancha is the cat however never minding these threats snarled and held on but at last the duke pulled it off and flung it out of the window don quixote was left with a face as full of holes as a sieve and a nose not in very good condition and greatly vexed that they did not let him finish the battle he had been so stoutly fighting with that villain of an enchanter they sent for some oil of john's wort and altisidora herself with her own fair hands bandaged all the wounded parts and as she did so she said to him in a low voice all these mishaps have befallen thee hard-hearted knight for the sin of thy insensibility and obstinacy and god grant thy squire sancho may forget to whip himself so that that dearly beloved dulcinea of thine may never be released from her enchantment that thou mayest never come to her bed at least while i who adore thee am alive to all this don quixote made no answer except to heave deep sighs and then stretched himself on his bed thanking the duke and duchess for their kindness not because he stood in any fear of that bell-ringing rabble of enchanters in cat shape but because he recognized their good intentions in coming to his rescue the duke and duchess left him to repose and withdrew greatly grieved at the unfortunate result of the joke as they never thought the adventure would have fallen so heavy on don quixote or cost him so dear for it cost him five days of confinement to his bed during which he had another adventure pleasanter than the late one which his chronicler will not relate just now in order that he may turn his attention to sancho panza who was proceeding with great diligence and drollery in his government End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 46 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 47 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 47. Wherein is continued the account of how Sancho Panza conducted himself in his government. The history says that from the justice court they carried Sancho to a sumptuous palace, where in a spacious chamber there was a table laid out with royal magnificence. The clarion sounded as Sancho entered the room, and four pages came forward to present him with water for his hands, which Sancho received with great dignity. The music ceased, and Sancho seated himself at the head of the table, for there was only that seat placed, and no more than one cover laid. A personage, who it appeared afterwards was a physician, placed himself standing by his side with a whalebone wand in his hand. They then lifted up a fine white cloth covering fruit and a great variety of dishes of different sorts. One who looked like a student said grace, and a page put a laced bib on Sancho, while another, who played the part of head carver, placed a dish of fruit before him. But hardly had he tasted a morsel when the man with the wand touched the plate with it, and they took it away from before him with the utmost celerity. The carver, however, brought him another dish, and Sancho proceeded to try it, but before he could get at it, not to say taste it, already the wand had touched it, and a page had carried it off with the same promptitude as the fruit. Sancho, seeing this, was puzzled, and looking from one to another, asked if this dinner was to be eaten after the fashion of a jugglery trick. To this he with the wand replied, it is not to be eaten senor governor except as is usual and customary in other islands where there are governors i senor am a physician and i am paid a salary in this island to serve its governors as such and i have a much greater regard for their health than for my own studying day and night and making myself acquainted with the governor's constitution in order to be able to cure him when he falls sick the chief thing i have to do is to attend at his dinners and suppers and allow him to eat what appears to me to be fit for him, and keep from him what I think will do him harm and be injurious to his stomach. And therefore I ordered that plate of fruit to be removed as being too moist, and that other dish I ordered to be removed as being too hot, and containing many spices that stimulate thirst. For he who drinks much kills and consumes the radical moisture wherein life consists. Well then, said Sancho, that dish of roast partridges there that seems so savoury will not do me any harm to this the physician replied of those my lord the governor shall not eat so long as i live why so said sancho because replied the doctor our master hippocrates the pole star and beacon of medicine says in one of his aphorisms omnis saturatio mala perdicis autem pessima which means all repletion is bad but that of partridge is the worst of all in that case said sancho let senor doctor see among the dishes that are on the table what will do me most good and least harm and let me eat it without tapping it with his stick for by the life of the governor and so may god suffer me to enjoy it but i'm dying of hunger and in spite of the doctor and all he may say to deny me food is the way to take my life instead of prolonging it your worship is right senor governor said the physician and therefore your worship, I consider, should not eat of those stewed rabbits there, because it is a furry kind of food. If that veal were not roasted and served with pickles, you might try it, but it is out of the question. That big dish that is smoking farther off, said Sancho, seems to me to be an olla podrida, and out of the diversity of things in such ollas, I can't fail to light upon something tasty and good for me. Absit, said the doctor, far from us be any such base thought. There is nothing in the world less nourishing than an olla podrida. To canons or rectors of colleges or peasants' weddings with your ollas podridas. But let us have none of them on the tables of governors, for everything that is present should be delicate and refined. And the reason is that always, everywhere, and by everybody, simple medicines are more esteemed than compound ones. For we cannot go wrong in those that are simple while in the compound we may by merely altering the quantity of the things composing them but what i am of opinion the governor should eat now in order to preserve and fortify his health is a hundred or so of wafer cakes and a few thin slices of conserve of quinces which will settle his stomach and help his digestion sancho on hearing this threw himself back in his chair 
and surveyed the doctor steadily and in a solemn tone asked him what his name was and where he had studied he replied my name senor governor is dr pedro recio de aguero i am a native of a place called tirteafuera which lies between caracuel and almodovar del campo on the right-hand side and i have the degree of doctor from the university of osuna to which sancho glowing all over with rage returned then let dr pedro recio de malaguero native of tirteafuera a place that's on the right-hand side as we go from caracuel to almodovar del campo graduate of osuna get out of my presence at once or i swear by the sun i'll take a cudgel and by dint of blows beginning with him i'll not leave a doctor in the whole island at least of those i know to be ignorant for as to learned wise sensible physicians them i will reverence and honour as divine persons once more i say let pedro recio get out of this or i'll take this chair i am sitting on and break it over his head and if they call me to account for it i'll clear myself by saying i serve god in killing a bad doctor a general executioner and now give me something to eat or else take your government for a trade that does not feed its master is not worth two beans the doctor was dismayed when he saw the governor in such a passion and he would have made a tirtea fuera out of the room but that the same instant a post-horn sounded in the street and the carver putting his head out of the window turned round and said it's a courier from my lord the duke no doubt with some dispatch of importance the courier came in all sweating and flurried and taking a paper from his bosom placed it in the governor's hands sancho handed it to the majordomo and bade him read the superscription which ran thus to don sancho panza governor of the island of barataria into his own hands are those of his secretary sancho when he heard this said which of you is my secretary i am senor said one of those present for i can read and write and am a biscayan with that addition said sancho you might be secretary to the emperor himself open this paper and see what it says the new-born secretary obeyed and having read the content said the matter was one to be discussed in private sancho ordered the chamber to be cleared the majordomo and the carver only remaining so the doctor and the others withdrew and then the secretary read the letter which was as follows it has come to my knowledge senor don sancho panza that certain enemies of mine and of the island are about to make a furious attack upon it some night i know not when it behooves you to be on the alert and keep watch that they surprise you not i also know by trustworthy spies that four persons have entered the town in disguise in order to take your life because they stand in dread of your great capacity keep your eyes open and take heed who approaches you to address you and eat nothing that is presented to you i will take care to send you aid if you find yourself in difficulty but in all things you will act as may be expected of your judgment from this place the sixteenth of august at four in the morning your friend the duke sancho was astonished and those who stood by made believe to be so too and turning to the majordomo he said to him what we have got to do first and it must be done at once is to put dr recio in the lock-up for if any one wants to kill me it is he and by a slow death and the worst of all which is hunger likewise said the carver it is my opinion your worship should not eat anything that is on this table for the whole was a present from some nuns and as they say behind the cross there is the devil i don't deny it said sancho so for the present give me a piece of bread and four pounds or so of grapes no poison can come in them for the fact is i can't go on without eating and if we are to be prepared for these battles that are threatening us we must be well provisioned for it is the tripes that carry the heart and not the heart the tripes and you secretary answer my lord the duke and tell him that all his commands shall be obeyed to the letter as he directs and say from me to my lady the duchess that i kiss her hands and that i beg of her not to forget to send my letter and bundle to my wife teresa panza by a messenger and i will take it as a great favour and will not fail to serve her in all that may lie within my power and as you are about it you might enclose a kiss of the hand to my master don quixote that he may see i am grateful bred and as a good secretary and a good biscayan you may add whatever you like and whatever will come in best and now take away this cloth and give me something to eat and i'll be ready to meet all the spies and assassins and enchanters that may come against me or my island at this instant a page entered saying here is a farmer on business 
who wants to speak to your lordship on a matter of great importance he says it's very odd said sancho the ways of these men on business is it possible they can be such fools as not to see that an hour like this is no hour for coming on business we who govern and we who are judges are we not men of flesh and blood and are we not to be allowed the time required for taking rest unless they'd have us made of marble by god and on my conscience if the government remains in my hands which i have a notion it won't i'll bring more than one man on business to order however tell this good man to come in but take care first of all that he is not some spy or one of my assassins no my lord said the page for he looks like a simple fellow and either i know very little or he is as good as good bread there is nothing to be afraid of said the majordomo for we are all here would it be possible carver said sancho now that dr pedro recio is not here to let me eat something solid and substantial if it were even a piece of bread and an onion to-night at supper said the carver the shortcomings of the dinner shall be made good and your lordship shall be fully contented god grant it said sancho the farmer now came in a well-favoured man that one might see a thousand leagues off was an honest fellow and a good soul the first thing he said was which is the lord governor here which should it be said the secretary but he who is seated in the chair then i humble myself before him said the farmer and going on his knees he asked for his hand to kiss it sancho refused it and bade him stand up and say what he wanted the farmer obeyed and then said i am a farmer senor a native of miguel tura a village two leagues from ciudad real another tirtea fuera said sancho say on brother i know miguel tura very well i can tell you for it's not very far from my own town the case is this senor continued the farmer that by god's mercy i am married with the leave and license of the holy roman catholic church i have two sons students and the younger is studying to become bachelor and the elder to be licentiate i am a widower for my wife died or more properly speaking a bad doctor killed her on my hands giving her a purge when she was with child and if it had pleased god that the child had been born and was a boy i would have put him to study for doctor that he might not envy his brothers the bachelor and the licentiate so that if your wife had not died or had not been killed you would not now be a widower said sancho no senor certainly not said the farmer we've got that much settled said sancho get on brother for it's more bedtime than business time well then said the farmer this son of mine who is going to be a bachelor fell in love in the said town with a damsel called clara perilarina daughter of andres perilino a very rich farmer and this name of perilinas does not come to them by ancestry or descent but because all the family are paralytics and for a better name they call them so perilinas though to tell the truth the damsel is as fair as an oriental pearl and like a flower of the field if you look at her on the right side on the left not so much for on that side she wants an eye that she lost by smallpox and though her face is thickly and deeply pitted those who love her say they are not pits that are there but the graves where the hearts of her lovers are buried she is so cleanly that not to soil her face she carries her nose turned up as they say so that one would fancy it was running away from her mouth and with all this she looks extremely well for she has a wide mouth and but for wanting ten or a dozen teeth and grinders she might compare and compete with the comeliest of her lips i say nothing for they are so fine and thin that if lips might be reeled one might make a skein of them but being of a different colour from ordinary lips they are wonderful for they are mottled blue green and purple let my lord the governor pardon me for painting so minutely the charms of her who some time or other will be my daughter for i love her and i don't find her amiss paint what you will said sancho i enjoy your painting and if i had dined there could be no dessert more to my taste than your portrait that i have still to furnish said the farmer but a time will come when we may be able if we are not now and i can tell you senor if i could paint her gracefulness and her tall figure it would astonish you but that is impossible because she is bent double with her knees up to her mouth but for all that it is easy to see that if she could stand up she'd knock her head against the ceiling and she would have given her hand to my bachelor ere this only that she can't stretch it out for it's contracted but still one can see its elegance and fine make by its long furrowed nails that will do brother said sancho consider you have painted her from head to foot what is it you want now come to the point without all this beating about the bush 
and all these scraps and additions i want your worship senor said the farmer to do me the favour of giving me a letter of recommendation to the girl's father begging him to be so good as to let this marriage take place as we are not ill-matched either in the gifts of fortune or of nature for to tell the truth senor governor my son is possessed of a devil and there is not a day but the evil spirits torment him three or four times and from having once fallen into the fire he has his face puckered up like a piece of parchment and his eyes watery and always running but he has the disposition of an angel and if it was not for belabouring and pummeling himself he'd be a saint is there anything else you want good man said sancho there's another thing i'd like said the farmer but i'm afraid to mention it however out it must for after all i can't let it be rotting in my breast come what may i mean senor that i'd like your worship to give me three hundred or six hundred ducats as a help to my bachelor's portion to help him in setting up house for they must in short live by themselves without being subject to the interferences of their fathers-in-law just see if there's anything else you'd like said sancho and don't hold back from mentioning it out of bashfulness or modesty no indeed there is not said the farmer the moment he said this the governor started to his feet and seizing the chair he had been sitting on exclaimed by all that's good you ill-bred boorish don bumpkin if you don't get out of this at once and hide yourself from my sight i'll lay your head open with this chair you whore-son rascal you devil's own painter and is it at this hour you come to ask me for six hundred ducats how should i have them you stinking brute and why should i give them to you if i had them you knave and blockhead what have i to do with miguel tura or the whole family of the perlerines get out i say or by the life of my lord the duke i'll do as i said you're not from miguel tura but some knave sent here from hell to tempt me why you villain i have not yet had the government half a day and you want me to have six hundred ducats already the carver made signs to the farmer to leave the room which he did with his head down and to all appearance in terror lest the governor should carry his threats into effect for the rogue knew very well how to play his part but let us leave sancho in his wrath and peace be with them all and let us return to don quixote whom we left with his face bandaged and doctored after the cat wounds of which he was not cured for eight days and on one of these there befell him what seed hamet promises to relate with that exactitude and truth with which he is wont to set forth everything connected with this great history however minute it may be end of volume two part two chapter forty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter forty eight of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter forty eight of what befell don quixote with dona rodriguez the duchess's duenna together with other occurrences worthy of record and eternal remembrance exceedingly moody and dejected was the sorely wounded don quixote with his face bandaged and marked not by the hand of god but by the claws of a cat mishaps incidental to knight-errantry six days he remained without appearing in public and one night as he lay awake thinking of his misfortunes and of altisidora's pursuit of him he perceived that some one was opening the door of his room with a key and he at once made up his mind that the enamoured damsel was coming to make an assault upon his chastity and put him in danger of failing in the fidelity he owed to his lady dulcinea del toboso no said he firmly persuaded of the truth of his idea and he said it loud enough to be heard the greatest beauty upon earth shall not avail to make me renounce my adoration of her whom i bear stamped and graved in the core of my heart and the secret depths of my bowels be thou lady mine transformed into a clumsy country wench or into a nymph of golden tagus weaving a web of silk and gold let merlin or montesinos hold thee captive where they will where'er thou art thou art mine and where'er i am must be thine the very instant he had uttered these words the door opened he stood up on the bed wrapped from head to foot 
in a yellow satin coverlet with a cap on his head and his face and his moustaches tied up his face because of the scratches and his moustaches to keep them from drooping and falling down in which trim he looked the most extraordinary scarecrow that could be conceived he kept his eyes fixed on the door and just as he was expecting to see the love-smitten and unhappy altisidora make her appearance he saw coming in a most venerable duenna in a long white bordered veil that covered and enveloped her from head to foot between the fingers of her left hand she held a short lighted candle while with her right she shaded it to keep the light from her eyes which were covered by spectacles of great size and she advanced with noiseless steps treading very softly don quixote kept an eye upon her from his watch-tower in observing her costume and noting her silence he concluded that it must be some witch or sorceress that was coming in such a guise to work him some mischief and he began crossing himself at a great rate the spectre still advanced and on reaching the middle of the room looked up and saw the energy with which don quixote was crossing himself and if he was scared by seeing such a figure as hers she was terrified at the sight of his for the moment she saw his tall yellow form with the coverlet and the bandages that disfigured him she gave a loud scream and exclaiming jesus what's this i see let fall the candle in her fright and then finding herself in the dark turned about to make off but stumbling on her skirts in her consternation she measured her length with a mighty fall don quixote in his trepidation began saying i conjure thee phantom or whatever thou art tell me what thou art and what thou wouldst with me if thou art a soul in torment say so and all that my powers can do i will do for thee for i am a catholic christian and love to do good to all the world and to this end i have embraced the order of knight-errantry to which i belong the province of which extends to doing good even to souls in purgatory the unfortunate duenna hearing herself thus conjured by her own fear guessed don quixote's and in a low plaintive voice answered senor don quixote if so be you are indeed don quixote i am no phantom or spectre or soul in purgatory as you seem to think but doña rodriguez duenna of honour to my lady the duchess and i come to you with one of those grievances your worship is wont to redress tell me senora doña rodriguez said don quixote do you perchance come to transact any go-between business because i must tell you i am not available for anybody's purpose thanks to the peerless beauty of my lady dulcinea del toboso in short senora doña rodriguez if you will leave out and put aside all love messages you may go and light your candle and come back and we shall discuss all the commands you have for me and whatever you wish saving only as i said all seductive communications i carry nobody's messages senor said the duenna little you know me nay i'm not far enough advanced in years to take to any such childish tricks god be praised i have a soul in my body still and all my teeth and grinders in my mouth except one or two that the cold so common in this aragon country have robbed me of but wait a little while i go and light my candle and i will return immediately and lay my sorrows before you as before one who relieves those of all the world and without staying for an answer she quitted the room and left don quixote tranquilly meditating while he waited for her a thousand thoughts at once suggested themselves to him on the subject of this new adventure and it struck him as being ill done and worse advised in him to expose himself to the danger of breaking his plighted faith to his lady and said he to himself who knows but that the devil being wily and cunning may be trying now to entrap me with a duenna having failed with empresses queens duchesses marchionesses and countesses many a time have i heard it said by many a man of sense that he will sooner offer you a flat-nosed wench than a roman-nosed one and who knows but this privacy this opportunity this silence may awaken my sleeping desires and lead me in these my latter years to fall where i never have tripped in cases of this sort it is better to flee than to await the battle but i must be out of my senses to think and utter such nonsense for it is impossible that a long white-hooded spectacled duenna could stir up or excite a wanton thought in the most graceless bosom in the world is there a duenna on earth that has fair flesh is there a duenna in the world that escapes being ill-tempered wrinkled and prudish avaunt then ye duenna crew undelightful to all mankind 
oh but that lady did well who they say had at the end of her reception room a couple of figures of duennas with spectacles and lace curtains as if at work and those statues served quite as well to give an air of propriety to the room as if they had been real duennas so saying he leaped off the bed intending to close the door and not allow senora rodriguez to enter but as he went to shut it senora rodriguez returned with a wax candle lighted and having a closer view of don quixote with a coverlet round him and his bandages and nightcap she was alarmed afresh and retreating a couple of paces exclaimed am i safe sir knight for i don't look upon it as a sign of very great virtue that your worship should have got up out of bed i may well ask the same senora said don quixote and i do ask whether i shall be safe from being assailed and forced of whom and against whom do you demand that security sir knight said the duenna of you and against you i ask it said don quixote for i am not marble nor are you brass nor is it now ten o'clock in the morning but midnight or a trifle past it i fancy and we are in a room more secluded and retired than the cave could have been where the treacherous and daring aeneas enjoyed the fair soft-hearted dido but give me your hand senora i require no better protection than my own countenance and my own sense of propriety as well as that which is inspired by that venerable head-dress and so saying he kissed her right hand and took it in his own she yielding it to him with equal ceremoniousness and here seed hamet inserts a parenthesis in which he says that to have seen the pair marching from the door to the bed linked hand in hand in this way he would have given the best of the two tunics he had don quixote finally got into bed and doña rodriguez took her seat on a chair at some little distance from his couch without taking off her spectacles or putting aside the candle don quixote wrapped the bedclothes round him and covered himself up completely leaving nothing but his face visible and as soon as they had both regained their composure he broke silence saying now senora doña rodriguez you may unbosom yourself and out with everything you have in your sorrowful heart and afflicted bowels and by me you shall be listened to with chaste ears and aided by compassionate exertions i believe it replied the duenna from your worship's gentle and winning presence only such a christian answer could be expected the fact is then senor don quixote that though you see me seated in this chair here in the middle of the kingdom of aragon and in the attire of a despised outcast duenna i am from the asturias of oviedo and of a family with which many of the best of the province are connected by blood but my untoward fate and the improvidence of my parents who i know not how were unseasonably reduced to poverty brought me to the court of madrid where as a provision and to avoid greater misfortunes my parents placed me as seamstress in the service of a lady of quality and i would have you know that for hemming and sewing i have never been surpassed by any all my life my parents left me in service and returned to their own country and a few years later went no doubt to heaven for they were excellent good catholic christians i was left an orphan with nothing but the miserable wages and trifling presents that are given to servants of my sort in palaces but about this time without any encouragement on my part one of the esquires of the household fell in love with me a man somewhat advanced in years full bearded and personable and above all as good a gentleman as the king himself for he came of a mountain stock we did not carry on our loves with such secrecy but that they came to the knowledge of my lady and she not to have any fuss about it had us married with the full sanction of the holy mother roman catholic church of which marriage a daughter was born to put an end to my good fortune if i had any not that i died in childbirth for i passed through it safely and in due season but because shortly afterwards my husband died of a certain shock he received and had i time to tell you of it i know your worship would be surprised and here she began to weep bitterly and said pardon me senor don quixote if i am unable to control myself for every time i think of my unfortunate husband my eyes fill up with tears god bless me with what an air of dignity he used to carry my lady behind him on a stout mule as black as jet for in those days they did not use coaches or chairs as they say they do now and ladies rode behind their squires this much at least i cannot help telling you that you may observe the good breeding and punctiliousness of my worthy husband 
as he was turning into the calle de santiago in madrid which is rather narrow one of the alcaldes of the court with two alguacils before him was coming out of it and as soon as my good squire saw him he wheeled his mule about and made as if he would turn and accompany him my lady who was riding behind him said to him in a low voice what are you about you sneak don't you see that i am here the alcalde like a polite man pulled up his horse and said to him proceed senor for it is i rather who ought to accompany my lady doña casilda for that was my mistress's name still my husband cap in hand persisted in trying to accompany the alcalde and seeing this my lady filled with rage and vexation pulled out a big pin or i rather think a bodkin out of her needle case and drove it into his back with such force that my husband gave a loud yell and writhing fell to the ground with his lady her two lackeys ran to rise her up and the alcalde and the alguacils did the same the guadalajara gate was all in commotion i mean the idlers congregated there my mistress came back on foot and my husband hurried away to a barber's shop protesting that he was run right through the guts the courtesy of my husband was noised abroad to such an extent that the boys gave him no peace in the street and on this account and because he was somewhat short-sighted my lady dismissed him and it was chagrin at this i am convinced beyond a doubt that brought on his death i was left a helpless widow with a daughter on my hands growing up in beauty like the sea-foam at length however as i had the character of being an excellent needlewoman my lady the duchess then lately married to my lord the duke offered to take me with her to this kingdom of aragon and my daughter also and here as time went by my daughter grew up and with her all the graces in the world she sings like a lark dances quick as thought foots it like a gypsy reads and writes like a schoolmaster and does sums like a miser of her neatness i say nothing for the running water is not purer and her age is now if my memory serves me sixteen years five months and three days one more or less to come to the point the son of a very rich farmer living in a village of my lord the duke's not very far from here fell in love with this girl of mine and in short how i know not they came together and under the promise of marrying her he made a fool of my daughter and will not keep his word and though my lord the duke is aware of it for i have complained to him not once but many and many a time and entreated him to order the farmer to marry my daughter he turns a deaf ear and will scarcely listen to me the reason being that as the deceiver's father is so rich and lends him money and is constantly going security for his debts he does not like to offend or annoy him in any way now senor i want your worship to take it upon yourself to redress this wrong either by entreaty or by arms for by what all the world says you came into it to redress grievances and right wrongs and help the unfortunate let your worship put before you the unprotected condition of my daughter her youth and all the perfections i have said she possesses and before god and on my conscience out of all the damsels my lady has there is not one that comes up to the sole of her shoe and the one they call altisidora and look upon as the boldest and gayest of them put in comparison with my daughter does not come within two leagues of her for i would have you know senor all is not gold that glitters and that same little altisidora has more forwardness than good looks and more impudence than modesty besides being not very sound for she has such a disagreeable breath that one cannot bear to be near her for a moment and even my lady the duchess but i'll hold my tongue for they say that walls have ears for heaven's sake doña rodriguez what ails my lady the duchess asked don quixote adjured in that way replied the duenna i cannot help answering the question and telling the whole truth senor don quixote have you observed the comeliness of my lady the duchess that smooth complexion of hers like a burnished polished sword those two cheeks of milk and carmine that gay lively step with which she treads or rather seems to spurn the earth so that one would fancy she went radiating health wherever she passed well then let me tell you she may thank first of all god for this and next two issues that she has one in each leg by which all the evil humours of which the doctors say she is full are discharged blessed virgin exclaimed don quixote and is it possible that my lady the duchess has drains of that sort i would not have believed it if the barefoot friars had told it me 
but as the lady doña rodriguez says so it must be so but surely such issues and in such places do not discharge humours but liquid amber verily i do believe now that this practice of opening issues is a very important matter for the health don quixote had hardly said this when the chamber door flew open with a loud bang and with the start the noise gave her doña rodriguez let the candle fall from her hand and the room was left as dark as a wolf's mouth as the saying is suddenly the poor duenna felt two hands seize her by the throat so tightly that she could not croak while some one else without uttering a word very briskly hoisted up her petticoats and with what seemed to be a slipper began to lay on so heartily that any one would have felt pity for her but although don quixote felt it he never stirred from his bed but lay quiet and silent nay apprehensive that his turn for a drubbing might be coming nor was the apprehension an idle one for leaving the duenna who did not dare to cry out well basted the silent executioners fell upon don quixote and stripping him of the sheet and the coverlet they pinched him so fast and so hard that he was driven to defend himself with his fists and all this in marvellous silence the battle lasted nearly half an hour and then the phantoms fled doña rodriguez gathered up her skirts and bemoaning her fate went out without saying a word to don quixote and he sorely pinched puzzled and dejected remained alone and there we will leave him wondering who could have been the perverse enchanter who had reduced him to such a state but that shall be told in due season for sancho claims our attention and the methodical arrangement of the story demands it end of volume two part two chapter forty eight Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 49 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 to This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter forty nine of what happened to sancho in making the round of his island we left the great governor angered and irritated by that portrait painting rogue of a farmer who instructed the majordomo as the majordomo was by the duke tried to practise upon him he however fool boor and clown as he was held his own against them all saying to those round him and to dr pedro recio who as soon as the private business of the duke's letter was disposed of had returned to the room now i see plainly enough that judges and governors ought to be and must be made of brass not to feel the importunities of the applicants that at all times and all seasons insist on being heard and having their business dispatched and their own affairs and no others attended to come what may and if the poor judge does not hear them and settle the matter either because he cannot or because that is not the time set apart for hearing them forthwith they abuse him and run him down and gnaw at his bones and even pick holes in his pedigree you silly stupid applicant don't be in a hurry wait for the proper time and season for doing business don't come at dinner hour or at bedtime for judges are only flesh and blood and must give to nature what she naturally demands of them all except myself for in my case i give her nothing to eat thanks to senor doctor pedro recio tirteria fuera here who would have me die of hunger and declares that death to be life and the same sort of life may god give him and all his kind i mean the bad doctors for the good ones deserve palms and laurels all who knew sancho panza were astonished to hear him speak so elegantly and did not know what to attribute it to unless it were that office and grave responsibility either smarten or stupefy men's wits at last dr pedro recio aguilera of tirtea fuera promised to let him have supper that night though it might be in contravention of all the aphorisms of hippocrates with this the governor was satisfied and looked forward to the approach of night and supper-time with great anxiety and though time to his mind stood still and made no progress nevertheless the hour he so longed for came and they gave him a beef salad with onions and some boiled calves feet rather far gone at this he fell to with greater relish than if they had given him francolin from milan 
pheasants from rome veal from sorrento partridges from moron or geese from labajos and turning to the doctor at supper he said to him look here senor doctor for the future don't trouble yourself about giving me dainty things or choice dishes to eat for it will be only taking my stomach off its hinges it is accustomed to goat cow bacon hung beef turnips and onions and if by any chance it is given these palace dishes it receives them squeamishly and sometimes with loathing what the head carver had best do is to serve me with what they call ollas podridas and the rottener they are the better they smell and he can put whatever he likes into them so long as it is good to eat and i'll be obliged to him and will requite him some day but let nobody play pranks on me for either we are or we are not let us live and eat in peace and good fellowship for when god sends the dawn he sends it for all i mean to govern this island without giving up a right or taking a bribe let every one keep his eye open and look out for the arrow for i can tell them the devil is in cantiana and if they drive me to it they'll see something that will astonish them nay make yourself honey and the flies eat you of a truth senor governor said the carver your worship is in the right of it in everything you have said and i promise you in the name of all the inhabitants of this island that they will serve your worship with all zeal affection and good will for the mild kind of government you have given a sample of to begin with leaves them no ground for doing or thinking anything to your worship's disadvantage that i believe said sancho and they would be great fools if they did or thought otherwise once more i say see to my feeding and my dapples for that is the great point and what is most to the purpose and when the hour comes let us go the rounds for it is my intention to purge this island of all manner of uncleanness and of all idle good-for-nothing vagabonds for i would have you know that lazy idlers are the same thing in a state as the drones in a hive that eat up the honey the industrious bees make i mean to protect the husbandman to preserve to the gentleman his privileges to reward the virtuous and above all to respect religion and honour its ministers what say you to that my friends is there anything in what i say or am i talking to no purpose there is so much in what your worship says senor governor said the majordomo that i am filled with wonder when i see a man like your worship entirely without learning for i believe you have none at all say such things and so full of sound maxims and sage remarks very different from what was expected of your worship's intelligence by those who sent us or by us who came here every day we see something new in this world jokes become realities and the jokers find the tables turned upon them night came and with the permission of dr pedro recio the governor had supper they then got ready to go the rounds and he started with the major-domo the secretary the head-carver the chronicler charged with recording his deeds and alguacils and notaries enough to form a fair-sized squadron in the midst marched sancho with his staff as fine a sight as one could wish to see and but a few streets of the town had been traversed when they heard a noise as of a clashing of swords they hastened to the spot and found that the combatants were but two who seeing the authorities approaching stood still and one of them exclaimed help in the name of god and the king are men to be allowed to rob in the middle of this town and rush out and attack people in the very streets be calm my good man said sancho and tell me what was the cause of this quarrel for i am the governor said the other combatant senor governor i will tell you in a very few words your worship must know that this gentleman has just now won more than a thousand reals in that gambling house opposite and god knows how i was there and gave more than one doubtful point in his favour very much against what my conscience told me he made off with his winnings and when i made sure he was going to give me a crown or so at least by way of a present as it is usual and customary to give men of quality of my sort who stand by to see fair or foul play and back up swindles and prevent quarrels he pocketed his money and left the house indignant at this i followed him and speaking him fairly and civilly asked him to give me if it were only eight reals for he knows i am an honest man and that i have neither profession nor property for my parents never brought me up to any or left me any but the rogue who is a greater thief than cacus and a greater sharper than andradia would not give me more than four reals so your worship may see how little shame in conscience he has 
but by my faith if you had not come up i'd have made him disgorge his winnings and he'd have learned what the range of the steel-yard was what say you to this asked sancho the other replied that all his antagonist said was true and that he did not choose to give him more than four reals because he very often gave him money and that those who expected presents ought to be civil and take what is given them with a cheerful countenance and not make any claim against winners unless they know them for certain to be sharpers and their winnings to be unfairly won and that there could be no better proof that he himself was an honest man than his having refused to give anything for sharpers always pay tribute to lookers-on who know them that is true said the majordomo let your worship consider what is to be done with these men what is to be done said sancho is this you the winner be you good bad or indifferent give this assailant of yours a hundred reals at once and you must disperse thirty more for the poor prisoners and you who have neither profession nor property and hang about the island in idleness take these hundred reals now in some time of the day to-morrow quit the island under sentence of banishment for ten years and under pain of completing it in another life if you violate the sentence for i'll hang you on a gibbet or at least the hangman will by my orders not a word from either of you or i'll make him feel my hand the one paid down the money and the other took it and the latter quitted the island while the other went home and then the governor said either i am not good for much or i'll get rid of these gambling houses for it strikes me they are very mischievous this one at least said one of the notaries your worship will not be able to get rid of for a great man owns it and what he loses every year is beyond all comparison more than what he makes by the cards on the minor gambling houses your worship may exercise your power and it is they that do most harm and shelter the most barefaced practices for in the houses of lords and gentlemen of quality the notorious sharpers dare not attempt to play their tricks and as the vice of gambling has become common it is better that men should play in houses of repute than in some tradesmen's where they catch an unlucky fellow in the small hours of the morning and skin him alive i know already notary that there is a good deal to be said on that point said sancho and now a tipstaff came up with a young man in his grasp and said senor governor this youth was coming towards us and as soon as he saw the officers of justice he turned about and ran like a deer a sure proof that he must be some evil doer i ran after him and had it not been that he stumbled and fell i should never have caught him what did you run for fellow said sancho to which the young man replied senor it was to avoid answering all the questions officers of justice put what are you by trade a weaver and what do you weave lance-heads with your worship's good leave you're facetious with me you plume yourself on being a wag very good and where were you going just now to take the air senor and where does one take the air in this island where it blows good your answers are very much to the point you are a smart youth but take notice that i am the air and that i blow upon you astern and send you to jail oh there lay hold of him and take him off i'll make him sleep there to-night without air my god said the young man your worship will make me sleep in jail just as soon as make me king why shan't i make thee sleep in jail said sancho have i not the power to arrest thee and release thee whenever i like all the power your worship has said the young man won't be able to make me sleep in jail how not able said sancho take him away at once where he'll see his mistake with his own eyes even if the jailer is willing to exert his interested generosity on his behalf for i'll lay a penalty of two thousand ducats on him if he allows him to stir a step from the prison that's ridiculous said the young man the fact is all the men on earth will not make me sleep in prison tell me you devil said sancho have you got any angel that will deliver you and take off the irons i am going to order them to put upon you now senor governor said the young man in a sprightly manner let us be reasonable and come to the point granted your worship may order me to be taken to prison and to have irons and chains put on me and to be shut up in a cell and may lay heavy penalties on the jailer if he lets me out and that he obeys your orders still if i don't choose to sleep and choose to remain awake all night without closing an eye will your worship with all your power be able to make me sleep if i don't choose no truly said the secretary and the fellow has made his point 
so then said sancho it would be entirely of your own choice you would keep from sleeping not in opposition to my will no senor said the youth certainly not well then go and god be with you said sancho be off home to sleep and god give you sound sleep for i don't want to rob you of it but for the future let me advise you don't joke with the authorities because you may come across some one who will bring down the joke on your own skull the young man went his way and the governor continued his round and shortly afterwards two tipstaffs came up with a man in custody and said senor governor this person who seems to be a man is not so but a woman and not an ill-favoured one in man's clothes they raised two or three lanterns to her face and by their light they distinguished the features of a woman to all appearance of the age of sixteen or a little more with her hair gathered into a gold and green silk net and fair as a thousand pearls they scanned her from head to foot and observed that she had on red silk stockings with garters of white taffety bordered with gold and pearl her breeches were of green and gold stuff and under an open jacket or jerkin of the same she wore a doublet of the finest white and gold cloth her shoes were white and such as men wear she carried no sword at her belt but only a richly ornamented dagger and on her fingers she had several handsome rings in short the girl seemed fair to look at in the eyes of all and none of those who beheld her knew her the people of the town said they could not imagine who she was and those who were in on the secret of the jokes that were to be practised upon sancho were the ones who were most surprised for this incident or discovery had not been arranged by them and they watched anxiously to see how the affair would end sancho was fascinated by the girl's beauty and he asked her who she was where she was going and what had induced her to dress herself in that garb she with her eyes fixed on the ground answered in modest confusion i cannot tell you senor before so many people what it is of such consequence to me to have kept secret one thing i wish to be known that i am no thief or evil-doer but only an unhappy maiden whom the power of jealousy has led to break through the respect that is due to modesty hearing this the majordomo said to sancho make the people stand back senor governor that this lady may say what she wishes with less embarrassment sancho gave the order and all except the majordomo the head carver and the secretary fell back finding herself then in the presence of no more the damsel went on to say i am the daughter sirs of pedro perez mazorca the wool farmer of this town who is in the habit of coming very often to my father's house that won't do senora said the majordomo for i know pedro perez very well and i know he has no child at all either son or daughter and besides though you say he is your father you add then that he comes very often to your father's house i had already noticed that said sancho i am confused just now sirs said the damsel and i don't know what i am saying but the truth is that i am the daughter of diego de la lana whom you must all know ay that will do said the majordomo for i know diego de la lana and know that he is a gentleman of position and a rich man and that he has a son and a daughter and that since he was left a widower nobody in all this town can speak of having seen his daughter's face for he keeps her so closely shut up that he does not give even the son a chance of seeing her and for all that report says she is extremely beautiful it is true said the damsel and i am that daughter whether report lies or not as to my beauty you sirs will have decided by this time as you have seen me and with this she began to weep bitterly on seeing this the secretary leant over to the head carver's ear and said to him in a low voice something serious has no doubt happened this poor maiden that she goes wandering from home in such a dress and at such an hour and one of her rank too there can be no doubt about it returned the carver and moreover her tears confirm your suspicion sancho gave her the best comfort he could and entreated her to tell them without any fear what had happened her as they would all earnestly and by every means in their power endeavour to relieve her the fact is sir said she that my father has kept me shut up these ten years for so long is it since the earth received my mother mass is said at home in a sumptuous chapel and all this time i have seen but the sun in the heaven by day and the moon and the stars by night nor do i know what streets are like or plazas or churches or even men except my father and a brother i have and pedro perez the wool farmer whom because he came frequently to our house 
I took it into my head to call my father to avoid naming my own. This seclusion and the restrictions laid upon my going out, were it only to church, have been keeping me unhappy for many a day and month past. I longed to see the world, or at least the town where I was born, and it did not seem to me that this wish was inconsistent with the respect maidens of good quality should have for themselves. When I heard them talking of bullfights taking place, and of javelin games, and of acting plays, I asked my brother, who was a year younger than myself, to tell me what sort of things these were, and many more that I had never seen. He explained them to me as well as he could, but the only effect was to kindle in me a still stronger desire to see them. At last, to cut short the story of my ruin, I begged and entreated my brother, oh, that I had never made such an entreaty, and once more she gave way to a burst of weeping. Proceed, senora, said the majordomo, and finish your story of what has happened to you, for your words and tears are keeping us all in suspense. I have but little more to say, though many a tear to shed, said the damsel, for ill-placed desires can only be paid for in some such way. The maiden's beauty had made a deep impression on the head-carver's heart, and he again raised his lantern for another look at her, and thought they were not tears she was shedding, but seed-pearl or dew of the meadow. Nay, he exalted them still higher, and made oriental pearls of them, and fervently hoped her misfortune might not be so great a one as her tears and sobs seemed to indicate. The governor was losing patience at the length of time the girl was taking to tell her story, and told her not to keep them waiting any longer, for it was late, and there still remained a good deal of the town to be gone over. She, with broken sobs and half-suppressed sighs, went on to say, My misfortune, my misadventure is simply this, that I entreated my brother to dress me up as a man in a suit of his clothes, and take me some night when our father was asleep to see the whole town. He, overcome by my entreaties, consented and dressing me in this suit and himself in clothes of mine that fitted him as if made for him for he has not a hair on his chin and might pass for a very beautiful young girl to-night about an hour ago more or less we left the house and guided by our youthful and foolish impulse we made the circuit of the whole town and then as we were about to return home we saw a great troop of people coming and my brother said to me sister this must be the round stir your feet and put wings to them and follow me as fast as you can, lest they recognize us, for that would be a bad business for us. And so saying, he turned about and began, I cannot say to run, but to fly. In less than six paces I fell from fright, and then the officers of justice came up and carried me before your worships, where I find myself put to shame before all these people as whimsical and vicious. So then, senora, said Sancho, no other mishap has befallen you, nor was it jealousy that made you leave home, as you said at the beginning of your story? Nothing has happened me, said she, nor was it jealousy that brought me out, but merely a longing to see the world, which did not go beyond seeing the streets of this town. The appearance of the tipstaffs with their brother in custody, whom one of them had overtaken as he ran away from his sister, now fully confirmed the truth of what the damsel said. He had nothing on but a rich petticoat, in a short blue damask cloak with fine gold lace and his head was uncovered and adorned only with its own hair which looked like rings of gold so bright and curly was it the governor the majordomo and the carver went aside with him and unheard by his sister asked him how he came to be in that dress and he with no less shame and embarrassment told exactly the same story as his sister to the great delight of the enamoured carver the governor, however, said to them, In truth, young lady and gentleman, this has been a very childish affair, and to explain your folly and rashness, there was no necessity for all this delay and all these tears and sighs. For if you had said we are so and so, and we escaped from our father's house in this way, in order to ramble about, out of mere curiosity and with no other object, there would have been an end of the matter, and none of these little sobs and tears and all the rest of it. That is true, said the damsel but you see the confusion i was in was so great it did not let me behave as i ought no harm has been done said sancho come we will leave you at your father's house perhaps they will not have missed you and another time don't be so childish or eager to see the world for a respectable damsel should have a broken leg and keep at home and the woman and the hen by gadding about are soon lost and she who is eager to see is also eager to be seen 
i say no more the youth thanked the governor for his kind offer to take them home and they directed their steps towards the house which was not far off on reaching it the youth threw a pebble up at a grating and immediately a woman servant who was waiting for them came down and opened the door to them and they went in leaving the party marvelling as much at their grace and beauty as at the fancy they had for seeing the world by night and without quitting the village which however they set down to their youth the head carver was left with a heart pierced through and through and he made up his mind on the spot to demand the damsel in marriage of her father on the morrow making sure she would not be refused him as he was a servant of the duke's and even to sancho ideas and schemes of marrying the youth to his daughter sanchica suggested themselves and he resolved to open the negotiation at the proper season persuading himself that no husband could be refused to a governor's daughter and so the night's round came to an end and a couple of days later the government whereby all his plans were overthrown and swept away as will be seen farther on end of volume two part two chapter forty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine